Welcome to the Living Rock Podcast. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Thank you, everyone. Please take your seats. I'm going to start, actually, with a, a video. Uh, just that it was something that the kind of I was thinking about in preparation of today. So I've just done a short video that we'll, we'll show first, and then I'll come back and, and kick us off. Good morning. As I'm preparing for uh, this morning's message, I'm in our office here at home, and it's reminded me of the times where I have shared from this space, uh, particularly during lockdown. In fact, all of the messages that came from here were during a time in lockdown, and just reminded of how limiting things have been for such a long time, and yet over the last six months, how things have begun to open up again for us. And it feels a bit like as a nation, we've, been, we've come out of a place of smallness, almost like a little bit of a, a, a slightly dark, dingy tunnel. Um, this office isn't that bad, but you understand what I mean. Into potentially a very wide and bright expanse. And for some, this space, this limited space, has felt limiting, has felt frustrating because of that. And for some of us, this limited space, this restriction, has brought with it actually some security and some comfort. And now as we're emerging out of that, it brings out in us different feelings and different emotions, all very, very legitimate. You know, as we've emerged from this place of restriction and limitation, we've done so at different speeds, with different levels of confidence, into different situations and phases of life. And to some, it's felt scary and overwhelming and unnerving, and to others, exciting and releasing. And part of what we've had to do is really build up our stamina again to decide what to do now with these options that are suddenly ahead of us, these new opportunities. We've had to think again about what to pick up, what to prioritize, how to spend our time, who to spend our time with, where to go, what to do, how to spend our money, how to budget, particularly during times of financial pressure. And like I say, it's, it's a big shift that we're all going through together. And in it all, I believe God wants us to know this is a year of expansion, a year of growth. He wants us to be stirred and excited by what's ahead. And I believe a key to that is in this series, which is all about faith, hope and love. And how these three things will define us as God's people, will set us apart from everyone else and will enable us to fulfill all that God has for us. So I hope this series really blesses you. So that's what we're going to look at. We're going to look at faith, hope and love together. And, um, you know, over the last couple of years, it's not like everything's been on hold. Um, God has always been working, is always working. And there have been things that have been produced and achieved in that time as well. So please don't think that nothing's happened over the last two years. But I've really felt like, has anybody else felt that, that shift of coming out of hibernation an extended period of, stace, of hibernation. And all of a sudden, everything's opening up again. And Sarah and I have talked at different times, like, wow, we really need to get our stamina back up. You know, we've only sat with, we only had one evening out in two days, and all of a sudden, I'm ready for a, a week off. But, <laughs> but in it all, you know, God wants us, I believe, to understand that 2022 presents us with fresh challenges and wonderful fresh opportunities. And in the shifts and the changes we're going through, the decisions that we make, are really important now because of that. And that we're not to, that we're to be intentional in that, about what we do with our personal life, what we do in our family life, what we do in our work life, our church life, our social life, that during all of these things ramping back up again, that above all else, we are seeking first the kingdom. That above all else, we're putting God's rule, God's will first. That we're only doing what God wants us to do. And that doesn't mean we need to be weird about that. Like, Lord, do you want me to go to Aldi at two o'clock or three o'clock? It's only your will, Lord. You know, it's not, it's not being weird about that. But it's just about us knowing that the Holy Spirit wants to guide us into everything that's new and fresh again. Some things that are older, some things that are new, but the Holy Spirit wants to lead us. And therefore, we can trust in his peace. The peace to do some things when we're guarded by that. And when the peace leaves us, that's a good test to say, well, maybe I shouldn't be doing this now. That we let the peace of the Holy Spirit, the peace of God, guard our hearts and help us in our decisions. We know there are principles and promises in his word that will help us make good decisions. And we're part of a people that will help us make good decisions. I just want to say this. As elders, 
part of our role towards you as the church, if you're part of Living Rock Church, is to help you, to give you wise counsel and advice. Please don't be afraid to ask us if you want some counsel and some advice. We take that really seriously and we really appreciate that. So there's loads of things that are really important. But, you know, over these times, it's important that faith, hope, and love define everything that we do. That we remind ourselves over and over again that everything we do is defined and framed by our faith in Jesus Christ. Everything is framed and defined by our faith in Jesus Christ. That we remain steadfast as we hold on to the hope that we have in God's promises. I know there are people in this room who are still facing challenging trials and situations, but I'm saying to you and encouraging you, hold on to that hope. Remain steadfast in the hope. In fact, Hope is pretty useless if it's not in adversity. Hope is made in adversity. Hope is proven in adversity. And it upholds us during that time. And then we resolve that all that we do is motivated by God's love. It's how I relate to him. It's how I know he relates to me. And it's how I relate to you. And it's how you relate to me. That we're motivated in everything by God's love. Faith, hope and love from start to finish. You know, it's so important that we seek first the kingdom because once we put God's rule and God's will first, here's the wonderful thing, we can't lose. We can't fail. We become more than conquerors, in a sense, by default. If we put him first, everything else is added. Isn't that what it says in the word? And and why is that? Because the kingdom of God is always on the advance. It's because the kingdom of God is always on the front foot. It's because the kingdom of God is always working, even if you can't see that it's working, it's working. Like yeast in the batch of dough, or the seed that's growing under the soil. Being set apart as kingdom people, full of faith, full of hope, and full of love. That we're saved through our faith and our trust in a God who's sovereign and his timing is perfect, and we trust him. Our faith is in him. We're secure in the hope that his plan is unchanging and unchangeable, and unstoppable it will come to pass and we're sold out on loving him with all we've got and loving one another as we love ourselves with faith hope and love nothing is wasted and even if there are times if you look back over the last six months 12 months 18 months 10 years 20 years where you feel like locusts have come the stripping locusts have come and the 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 ravenous locusts but God is a God of restoration My hope isn't in what's been taken. My hope is is in what God has for me. God's plan for this world is a plan of restoration. As his kingdom is established on earth, as his will is done, as it extends into the earth. Cali Hill. God's kingdom has come to that street in Leicester. It's transformed the street. (laughs) One of the dodgiest streets in town now is a place of blessing. Why? Because the kingdom of God has come there. Because kingdom people have said... We're going to take this street in the name of Jesus. Isn't that fantastic? What a wonderful practical example. In Mike's body, the kingdom of God has come. Where a blood clot and a heart failure was going to be his portion. No, God says, I'm going to come and I'm going to bring healing to your body. So that even the doctors are amazed at how quickly a clot dissipates and he can come off all the treatment that they thought he was going to be on long term. God's kingdom has come. God is a God of restoration. He's given us little hints of that again today. And if you think about our life, if we think about our lives, we'll have seen hints of these things throughout our lives. Kingdom of God is coming. It's righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Not by might, not by power, not by striving, not by strength, but by my spirit. That's how God achieves everything. By his wonderful, powerful, precious Holy Spirit. And the Father's plan is rooted and entirely reliant on the work of Jesus Christ, of his Son. Of his life, his death, his resurrection, his ascension, the sending of the Holy Spirit. Everything that God, God put everything on Jesus. Totally backed him. He didn't keep some chips back in the game in case it didn't come through. He put everything, he put all of his faith in the Son to achieve everything. And Jesus fulfilled it. Why would I put my faith anywhere else than in him and his work? And we have this hope, this certainty and, and, and that, that's sealed in us because we have the deposit of the Holy Spirit who's a seal to say, everything that's been promised, yeah. you'll get it. Right. You'll get it. It may not even be this side of your earthly life, but you will get everything that is promised to you. 
There are men and women of faith who have died in faith. We read about them in Hebrews 11, heroes of faith that had a hope and that hope has not been lost. In fact, God has extended the time so that others can be brought into that and we share this hope together and ultimately that hope will be fulfilled in the return of Jesus Christ. This hopeful expectation that we have is in his glorious return for a glorious bride where everything is renewed. The heavens and the earth are renewed. All things are brought under his rule. Sin is dealt with. Evil is abolished. The enemy is completely cast down and we are entering into a new heaven and a new earth and a new age, the age of the kingdom. That's what God has for us. And in the meantime, God is building his church. Jesus is building his church. God wants his church and plans and intends for his church to display his multifaceted wisdom, his glorious creativity and power to all of the heavenly realms. That as the heavenly realms look, all authorities and rulers look on the church, they see the evidence of God's majesty and wisdom. That's us. Have a little look around. Because each face is a facet of God's multifaceted wisdom. Isn't that amazing? I can see quite a few facets today. It's quite handy. Faces in facet as well. It works, doesn't it? And the church is being built by Jesus. Being built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Jesus Christ as the cornerstone. And then he is carefully and masterfully joining living stones together to form this temple that's glorious that he's going to fill with his Holy Spirit. And the fullness of the Holy Spirit will present the fruit and the gift and the power of the Holy Spirit that will display God's glory to the heavenly realms and to the earth. The body of Christ is this temple that's magnificent and it's global and it's multicultural and it's multilingual and it's multicolored and it's multigenerational and it's multi-gifted and it's amazing and we're part of that church. Isn't that amazing? The body of Christ is being brought to maturity, being built up by the ascended Christ's gifts to the church, men and women who are here to make the church well secured and well founded and equip us to do the works of service that God has prepared for us and we'll grow more and more in unity and faith and into the full and complete stature and standard of Jesus Christ. That's the church, that's us. And therefore, we have to be defined by these three wonderful attributes, faith, hope and love. Because these three things will distinguish us from everyone else. These are kingdom distinctives. They are interconnected, abiding, interlinking, theological virtues given by an eternal God that he wants us to express. That as a people, faith, hope, and love will make us stand up and stand out. Without fail. If you meet somebody who's got genuine faith, you meet somebody who's got legitimate hope, you meet somebody who is just so loving, I think you'll probably think they're pretty special. I like them. I think I want to spend a bit of time with them. And I'm in a room full of those sorts of people, by the way. That's why I'm quite excited this morning. But faith, what is faith? It's wherever you put your trust. It's who or what you trust in. And who do we put our trust in? The Almighty God, the Eternal One, and Jesus Christ, His Son, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That's where our faith is. But there are so many people in this world who don't know what to put their faith in. Or if they do put their faith in it, it's a mishmash of ideas and ideals and individuals and it's shifting sand. Our faith is in the rock. Totally immovable. Hope. What is hope? Well, it's what you expect. It's your genuine, legitimate expectation. And our hope is in what? It's in God and his promises. And it's in Jesus' example because Jesus has gone ahead and done this already. We've seen what our hope is pinned on. It's, about, it's, it's what Jesus has already done. That he's passed through death and he's resurrected. And he's received his resurrection body. That's something that I am looking forward to enjoying. Has anybody thought about that? Your resurrection body lately? Has anybody thought about that? There's going to be something amazing that's ready for us in advance. This is just a... This is just a kernel. It's just a crusty old seed. 
You don't have to agree with me. <laughs> but in eternity, after his return and his establishment of everything, I'm going to receive a resurrection body. Amen. No sickness, no tiredness, no fatigue, no hunger, but I still get to eat. <laughs> Why? I've seen it in him. I've seen it in Jesus. My hope is pinned in that. And love, this unconditional decision to set your affection on somebody, that's, the, that's real love. It's, it's God's love. But we live in a world where there's no hope. People don't know what to put their hope in anymore. People haven't got no idea where things are going or who to put their trust in or what's going to happen next. Everybody's fretting about all sorts of different things that are going on, but our hope is in something beyond that. We're not faithless and we're not hopeless. And we're not loveless. And we live in a world where to be loved is to earn that love somehow. If I project an image, if I'm useful or beautiful or wealthy or successful in any way, if I, by my achievements, then people will, will love me. I can earn love and I'll keep love that way. That's not God's love. We live in a world that has no faith, no hope, no love. Not really. But we have all of those things in spades, in abundance. Faith, hope, and love are these golden attributes that define our very lives as believers. Without faith, we're lost. We can't believe God or live for God. But with faith, we totally believe in him and we live for him. And therefore, we have purpose. One of the biggest questions, why am I here? Why am I here? What, what's all this about? Is there any purpose? Yes, there is. It's to know God and live for him. And that's how we do. We live by faith. We have our purpose. Good works prepared for us in advance to do. The other thing is destiny. Where is it all going? Well, as believers, because we have a hope and an ultimate expectation and a joy, we know where it's all going. So we know our destiny is secure and safe. And that's securing for now, even if now isn't great. Even if now is tough, I know where my destiny is. It's like running home the other day in the rain. It was horrible, but I knew where I was going and I knew it was going to be a good place. And that kept me going. So people don't have that safe place that they're going for. They just know it's raining. Isn't that tragic? And without love, then I can't really know my true value or my identity. Who am I? Why am I here? Where is it all going? Who am I? Who are you? You're a child of God. He's adopted you into his family because he first loved you. He's set his affection on you. And he welcomed you in, in all of your mess. And every, in all of your unloveliness, he loved you. Perfectly, beautifully, sacrificially. And he continues to love you in that way. I know who I am now. I know where it's going now. I know I am here now. Why? Because of faith, hope, and love. I'm going to look at some verses, um, five verses. We'll look at a lot more, a lot more than five verses. I just want to set, set up some definitions of these three things because I don't want them to be remotely abstract for us. Really want them to sort of, I'd love to just hopefully fill out, I, and I'm sure there's a huge amount of understanding of these things already, but just to sort of fill those out, revisit them again, and re, uh, come, come back with definitions of what they are. Because one of the things I think we do, particularly with faith, is sometimes we're a bit too narrow with it. Because faith is so wide. And it's a, it's a wonderful thing. And uh, so in, we're going to look at a few verses. The first one is 1 Corinthians 13. Um, and we're going to look at verses where these uh, three things come together as a triplet. They also appear lots of times as, as doubles, as couplets. But we're going to look at verses where they are triplets. So 1 Corinthians 13, 7. Paul says, love never gives up. This was read at the wedding the other day. Love never gives up, never loses faith, is always hopeful and endures through every circumstance. It's like love fuels those two things as well. And here's the thing, they are interconnected. They're interlinked, they're intertwined. They, they're, they're distinctive, but they're also intertwined and they relate to one another. And hopefully that will become more clear as we look at these together over the coming months. And then at the end of 1 Corinthians 13, Paul wraps it up with this. These three things will last forever. Faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is love. 
Or in the N- a New American Standard Version, which is a more of a word-for-word translation, it says, but now faith, hope, and love abide these three, but the greatest of these is love. And the next slide just describes these words, what they mean in very short definition. You've got the Greek next to the, the English of faith is pistis, which is a conviction of the truth. We've got hope, which is elpis, which is an expectation, not necessarily of good, but also of evil. There's a lot of people who've got a lot of hope in that. <laughs> a joy, but as Christians, it's a joyful and confident expectation of salvation and resurrection. Love is the word agape, one we'll be more familiar with, which is faithful love expressed by God to his son, by the son to God and to the world. To abide is the word meno, which means to remain or tarry or continue to be present. Um, To be in a state that begins and continues, yet may or may not stop, which is quite interesting because I'm still grappling with how eternal these three things are, particularly faith and hope. It's a head scratcher. We're looking forward for Christopher to unpack that for us. I believe love is eternal because God is love. Faith and hope, are they needed in eternity? Hmm. I think might be. I think they might be. And then the greatest. The word megas. Megas. And it means greater in size, in value, maturity, age, rank, scale, quality, and excellence. These three things that interlink. And so let's just look at faith together to start with. This word pistis in the Greek. And as I said, it's the conviction of the truth of anything. So people put their faith in all sorts of things. Have you met them? Faith in horoscopes, faith in their insurance, faith in their job, faith in their loved ones, faith in all sorts of different, faith in, nobody puts faith in Everton anymore, but I, for it, in the 80s you could do it, but you can't do it anymore. But faith in things, but Christian faith is a conviction that exists purely in a, a belief and a trust in God. God is the creator and the ruler of all things. Give me a wave if you believe that. God is the creator and the ruler of all things. We share that faith. It's a good start. What about this? Jesus is the Messiah. Give me a wave if 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 your faith is there. He's the one and the only one through whom we obtain eternal salvation in the kingdom of God. Does that sound okay? Not gone too far off peace so far? You know, the classic example is, in many ways, it's what you put your weight on. You're all doing it right now. You're putting all of your faith in your chairs. Apart from Chris at the back, who's just ready to get off any second, just in case. He's always like a coiled spring. But you're putting all of... Nobody's thinking, oh, this just chair could collapse any second. I'm just going to sit on the edge of it and perch. No, you're, you're just wait. your weight is resting on your chair. You've put all your faith in it, all your trust in it. And, and the Latin word for, for, for faith is, is the word fides, which is where we have to confide in. And fidelity, it's to confide in, is to put your trust in somebody, that you can trust them with what you tell them. And fidelity is to be faithful. And here's the thing, faith in God produces in us faithfulness to him. That we rely on God, that we believe wholeheartedly in who he is and what he said, that this gift from God somehow comes into us and we, we, we put our faith and our trust in him that the faith comes by hearing the word, the truth, about who Jesus is. It's the truth of the gospel that we've been singing about this morning. And as a result of that, we're saved by faith. And God wants our faith to be founded in his faithfulness and then to create in us faithfulness. And then we live by faith. Made right by faith and we live by faith. Do you remember that phrase? The righteous will live by faith. Faith, Habakkuk 2.4, and it's picked up in the New Testament in these three uh, verses, Romans 1, Galatians 3, and Hebrews 11. Romans 1 says, I'm not ashamed of the power of the good news about Christ. It's the power of God at work, saving everyone who believes. The good news tells us how God makes us right in his sight, and this is accomplished from start to finish by faith. As the scriptures say, it is through faith that a righteous person has life or the righteous will live by faith. Galatians 3, it's clear that no one can be made right with God by trying to keep the law. 
For the scriptures say it is through faith that a righteous person has life. And then Hebrews 11, 6. Listen to this. It says, it is impossible to please God without faith. Now, that doesn't mean God's angry with you if you don't have faith. But it's only by faith that we can come to him. It's only by faith we can believe he's there in the first place to come to him. And then in coming to him, it's only by faith we believe that he's good and that he's faithful and that we can put our trust in him. And then as we put our faith and our trust in him, we come into relationship with him and we live for him and that really pleases him. He wants us to have faith in him. He wants us to have a relationship with him. And it's always in the present continuous. It's always ongoing. It's not, yeah, I had faith. I had faith when I was five and I gave my life to Jesus and now I don't have faith anymore. That's not faith. Faith is always an ongoing decision to believe and trust in him. Does everybody recognize that faith? Our faith produces faithfulness. Work emanates from faith. The things that we do come from that. So these verses here says, we pray to our God and Father about you. We think of your faithful work, your loving deeds and the enduring hope you have because of the Lord Jesus Christ. The work of faith, the labor of love, and the steadfastness of hope, as it says in the more word-for-word translation. Faith is there to promote in us work. We don't get faith from working, but faith produces work. Work emanates from faith. And faith also protects our hearts because we're saved by faith, we're made righteous by faith, and the breastplate of righteousness protects our hearts. So what I'd like you to do for a moment is if somebody came up to you and said, What is Christian faith? I would like you just to to say to Rita how you would define it in a a sentence. So everybody, if you could just turn to the person next to you, um, or if you're in a small, or a group of three, could you just describe to them in a short sentence what Christian faith is? Off you go, just for a second. If, um, If the person that you spoke to made some sense, could you just give me a little wave, that's okay? About 33% of people made sense. That's good. No, I'm sure it's more than that. (laughs) Well, the same ones, yeah. It's important that we can articulate these things, isn't it? And and in talking about them, I think it just helps to shape those things and reinforce some things. The next next thing we're going to look at is hope. It's the word elpis. It's the joyful, uh, confident, and sure expectation of receiving what God has promised. And in many ways, hope is powered by faith. And um, in many ways, faith is galvanized by hope, but they, they kind of work together. Um, and faith enables and promotes hopeful endurance and, and patience. And as I said earlier, hope focuses on a future joy and an ex- a confident expectation that, that that is where things are, are headed, especially into our eternal salvation and our resurrection bodies and therefore they're pinned on Christ as I've already said in his example and it's a a hardy endurance and a conviction that God will keep all of his promises and if you like consider Jesus as the rock faith latches into the rock that's our connection with him and from there there are links of hope that come from that latching into Christ that hang on to our faith and hope. And these, these chains, these links, sorry, are, are usually formed and they're galvanized and fortified by pressures and trials and challenges. But as we keep trusting him, this chain is formed. And as long as faith is in Christ and our hope is connected to that, then that chain can take any weight, can take any pressure. It won't break because of where it's connected. So Hebrews 6, 16 to 20 says... Now, when people take an oath, they call on someone greater than themselves to hold them to it. And without question, that oath is binding. God also bound himself with an oath so that those who received the promise could be perfectly sure that he would never change his mind. So God has given both his promise and his oath. And these two things are unchangeable because it is impossible for God to lie. Therefore, we who have fled to him for refuge have great confidence as we hold on to the hope that lies before us. And this hope is an anchor for our souls. And it leads us through the curtain into God's inner sanctuary. And listen to this. Jesus has already gone in there for us. 
He has become our eternal high priest in the order of Melchizedek. It's the pioneering work of Jesus. That's where our hope is. He's gone there. Therefore, I know when I follow him, I'll go there too. And I'll come into the same things that he's come into. Faith is the hold of a saviour in your life and that hold brings hope and our hope is founded on God's nature and promises and we're connected into that. When I'm... When I went, I went my first ever proper holiday abroad, I was 18, and I went with my cousin Christian and two other friends, and we went to Saint Tropez. It sounds really glamorous, it wasn't at all. We stayed in a ropey tent, had no money, and just ate baguettes every day, and that was about it, really. <laughs> but one of the things that we decided to do when we were there <clears throat> at uh, Luna Park, does anybody know? Johnny, have you been to Luna Park? Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. Um, you have, Derek? Yeah. Oh, okay, great. It was, there, was a, there was a bungee jump there. And this crane, this rickety crane, lifted you up above Luna Park and you do a bungee jump. At the time, it was 20, uh, uh, 20 francs, I think, because it was before the... That's how old I am. And uh, so the crane went up. <laughs> and my cousin Christian went first. And the only reason I did it was because I imagined Christian and I... I was single at the time. I imagined Christian at the time talking to some, some pretty girls about the fact that he'd done a bungee jump and I'd have to stand there silently and not be anywhere near as brave or heroic. <laughs> I didn't want that. So he went and he did the bungee jump, and it all went fine. And, and I just thought, it works. I've seen him do it. I know that'll be okay. That I'll go through exactly the same process. And I went up, into the, up on the crane, and the crane, as you went up, faced the arm of the, the, the crane. Sorry, the, the, the lift bit you're on. Faced the arm of the crane. And then slowly it would turn around so that the platform was then facing away from the arm, and then you would jump after un deux trois. Okay? And what happened was, as we were at the top, the... the the platform jammed. So we'd gone all the way up. I was up there with two French guys. I didn't speak French. They didn't speak English. Uh, all I knew was that they were kind of quite concerned about the fact that the platform wouldn't turn. And I could also see down below, it was sunset, a, a big crowd was starting to gather. And the one thing I didn't want more than anything else now at this point was them thinking I was scared to jump. And these two guys were trying to convince me to do it. And plus, I actually thought... It's safer, closer to the ground than it is on this platform right now. I'll take my... And so eventually it turned. And as soon as I had the opportunity to do it, I just went. But the reason that I did it, and the reason I knew it would work, was because Christian had gone ahead of me, and I'd seen him do it, and therefore it's going to work for me, it worked for him. Yeah. I mean, if I can put my hope in that, then I certainly can put my hope in Jesus Christ. <laughs> God reminds me of that. Trust Christian at Luna Park on that dodgy crane. You can definitely trust Jesus Christ. <laughs> yeah. You know, and as I said already, hope is most evident in adversity. That's when it, it, comes, it becomes more apparent. Somebody once said, he who never had a hope never had a fear. Grief summons hope to the aid of the sufferer. That's what he said. That hope is proven in adversity. Hope is proven in trials and difficulty. Please turn up this in your Bibles, Romans 5, 1 to 5, because this is a, a really important um, scripture where faith, hope, and love are, are all mentioned twice each in five verses. I'm not going to spend much longer on, on hope, and I'll be shorter on love, and then we'll, we'll be done for today. But I just would like to read these verses from the New Living Translation. So if you've got that, follow. If not, just follow along. But... Romans 5, 1 to 5. Therefore, since we have been made right in God's sight by all the good things that we've done, since we've been made right in God's sight by faith, we have peace with God because of what Jesus Christ, our Lord, has done for us. Our faith is in him. Because of our faith, Christ has brought us into this place of undeserved privilege where we now stand, and we confidently and joyfully look forward to sharing God's glory. Isn't God so generous? We can rejoice too that when we run into problems and trials, Paul, really, when? Could it not be if? Surely if I've got faith, I won't have any trials or challenges. Well, hang on a minute. We've clearly got faith. When we run into problems and trials, we can rejoice, for we know that they help us develop endurance, and endurance develops strength of character, and character strengthens our confident hope of salvation. And this hope will not lead to disappointment, for we know 
how dearly God loves us. Because he has given us the Holy Spirit to fill our hearts with his love. Isn't that an amazing verse? So much to unpack. Please, can I encourage you to read those verses, to ask the Holy Spirit to start to show things to us. But when our hope is secure in our faith, in the rock who loves us, then that chain of hope will withstand any pressure. Hope produces in us steadfastness, stickability. Those things, they, they emanate from hope. Our enduring hope or the steadfastness of our hope. And hope also protects our minds. It's interesting that hope is described as a helmet. But if we have hope, then we're seeing clearly what's ahead. And that shapes what we think about what we're doing and what's happening to us now. We see things clearly and as they are. So what I'd like you to do with the person that you just chatted to, could you just give a little quick Christian definition of hope, please, to one another? Just a short, if somebody was to say, what is Christian hope? How would you sum it up? Okay. <clears throat> and then the last of the three, the greatest is love. Agape or agape. It's this unconditional, decisional love, a mental attitude rather than an emotion, and may well include emotion but not, and feelings, but not necessarily. And usually emotion and feelings follow the decision to love. And it doesn't depend on perceived value, but instead it creates value. As soon as that God's love has been set on us, our value is sealed. However we might feel about ourselves or other people might perceive us, that gives us our value so that we are purchased not with mere silver and gold, but the precious blood of Jesus Christ. It's love that's based on will. I can't change how I feel, but I can change how I think. Somebody once said, if I had to be broken up mathematically, he said it's 10% emotion, 20% understanding, and 70% will to just love. And here's the thing, we can choose to love. As believers, we can now choose to love. In fact, we don't really have a choice because we're commanded to love. Matthew 22, 37 to 40, Jesus replies, and he says, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. A second is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. The entire law and all the demands of the prophets are based on these two commandments. Here's the thing, as we feel his love for us, he first loved us, that we love him back. It's hard to not love somebody who loves you. He loves us. When we know he loves us, we love him back. And we love ourselves. I don't mean like love ourselves. <laughs> but we actually have a genuine love for ourselves. Because if I'm supposed to love my neighbor as myself and I don't love myself, then I can't love my neighbor. All of a sudden, I know I have value, and I also know you have value in God's sight because of his love. Everything is changed by God's love. Everything we see, everything we think, everything we consider about ourselves and about him and about the world is, is totally transformed by his love. Love comes from God. 1 John 4, 7, Dear friends, let us continue to love one another, for love comes from God. Anyone who loves is a child of God and knows God. He's the resource. And we know that God loved us, 1 John 4, 19. We love each other because he first loved us. I, let, I read a beautiful description of love. He said, it's like a fire. He said, when a fire burns, it casts out light and heat indiscriminately. And it doesn't care about who's on the receiving end of the light or the heat. It just gives. Yeah. And anybody that comes close, no matter who they are, where they're from, what they're like, they will receive something from this fire, the light and the heat. It's indiscriminate. It doesn't discriminate at all. That's God's love. God's love to us and God's love through us. And we know then that love produces action. It's the love that Carl and Rachel and others have for the people in Leicester that produces not just a, ah, but a roll up the sleeves and get on the street and feed people. That happens in all sorts of different ways in the life of this church. People feel a love for others and they roll up their sleeves and they go and they do something. We do something. Produces action. And again, like faith, it protects our hearts because when our hearts are protected by love, then we feel the right way about ourselves and about one another and about God. 
So just, again, very briefly, if you would just describe somebody to, to somebody what God's love is, how would you sum up God's love? Somebody to say, why, why is God's love different to other types of love? How would you define it? If you could do that with your neighbor, one last, one last little exercise, and then we'll finish up. If I could just ask you to close your eyes for a moment, just to picture something in your minds. And analogies are never perfect, but I just, I'm just trying to think about how to consider these three, these, these, these three things, faith, hope, and love. Just close your eyes for a moment, because you know, we know we're familiar with the parable of the sower and the seed that's sown is the good news of the gospel of the kingdom. And you know, when the seed has been sown into your life, into my life, that it's been received, hasn't it? That's why we're here today. And by faith, roots have begun to enter into the soil of our hearts. Roots have begun to push down. They're roots of faith. And those roots begin to establish something. And from that, hope springs. A shoot of hope springs. And the thing about hope is it's always up. It's always forward. It's always going to the light. It's always going for, for, for what's the best, what's great, what's ahead. And so it pushes itself up out of the soil. Rooted by faith, hope begins to emerge. And then as faith and hope are tested at different times by the, the weather and, and, and situations, adverse weather conditions, the roots go down further, the, 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 the stem gets stronger, our faith and our hope are strengthened and they're worked. And from that, fruit is produced. Because in that seed is DNA. And that DNA is the DNA of the kingdom. And the fruit of the kingdom is produced in us. And the ultimate fulfillment of that fruit is love. That love is evidenced all of a sudden in that plant. There's fruit evident in that plant. And love is evident in our lives. And God wants us to put our roots down into him, to put our faith in him, to know that as we do, hope springs up and fruit springs forth. The evidence of his love for us and in us. And Lord, we just pray, we ask, Lord, that over these coming weeks and months, we would become more and more established and secure in our faith. Thank you, Jesus, for your work. Thank you for what you achieved on the cross for us, Lord. We thank you that your work is complete and perfect and wonderful. And we say all of our faith is in your work, Jesus. All of our faith is in your work, Lord. We're saved by that faith that we have in you. Lord, I pray let hope spring and be strengthened in our lives over these coming weeks and months. Lord, even in the times of testing or especially in the times of testing, Lord, that hope would be strong. I pray, Lord, that you'd strengthen and, and re galvanize hope in everyone's heart this morning in everyone's mind this morning that we'd set our sights on the realities of heaven where our true hope is found in you Jesus and Lord we pray let the fruit of your love be evident in our lives Lord let there be abundant fruit in our lives Lord of your love Holy Spirit I ask that you'd reassure us again of the love of God towards us Holy Spirit I ask that you'd cause us in our own hearts to appropriately love ourselves. That, Lord, that we would look to you with a fresh love and desire to follow you and serve you. And, Lord, that we'd look on one another and on this world, Lord, with your love, your compassion, your heart, Lord. That we'd be defined by these three wonderful attributes of faith, hope, and love. We pray for fresh revelation. We pray for fresh expression. We pray for a filling out of all of these wonderful truths so that your kingdom would come Your will would be done in our lives, in this earth, in our communities, on earth as it is in heaven. For your glory, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for listening this morning and look forward to hearing more. Thanks for joining us today. Search for us online and get information about upcoming events and more great teaching 